Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I have no idea what the hour is at which you're hearing this course. My name is William Ball. I've tried constitutional cases in the courts of 22 states, and I've been 10 times before the Supreme Court of the United States in religious liberty cases. I greeted you with the word good because I'm thinking of good as I think of these courses. The common good, God's good in our society. And of course, that's what the Catholic, the International Catholic University is all about. The workings of God's will and good in our society. And I guess therefore it's appropriate to begin this course in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, so be it indeed. An important aspect of the common good is the subject we're going to be dealing with in this series. That is to say, we could call it the adventures of the bark of Peter on the boiling sea of American law, or religious liberty in the United States. Now I realize that many of you taking this course are particularly interested in education, religion, and the courts, and indeed we'll be dealing with that. We'll be dealing with the major cases with which the Supreme Court has dealt, for example. But that is a part of the overall subject of American religious liberty, and the education cases relate very, very importantly to religious liberty generally because some of the doctrine, legal doctrine, generated in those cases has affected such things as taxation, the freedom of, uh, to bear witness in the religious order, marriage in the family, and so on. Now, if you think I'm going to plunge right into discussing the Supreme Court decisions, you're going to be disappointed. I'll get to them. But preliminarily, we need background. I'm sure that uh, Dr. Ralph McInerney, the founder of this university, has some very succinct, probably two-word Latin phrase, which stands for the idea, don't deal with present problems unless you've looked at their prior roots. Or as the Germans might put it, keine Wissenschaft ohne Geschichte. I just made that up. I, I taught German at, at Notre Dame when I was going to law school there, oh, eons ago. Background. As we speak of religious liberty, we're going to be focusing on two things. The relation of individuals to the state in matters of religious concern, and the relationship of religious communities or churches to the state. All of this you see, is going to relate to law. The two relationships and the law were brought into sharp focus about 2,000 years ago on the streets of Jerusalem, where our blessed Lord found himself approached by enemies. Oh, they began by flattering him with words of unctuous praise. And then they sprang the trap. Is it lawful, they asked, to give tribute to Caesar, or is it not? If he said not, he was into treason. If he responded that people could give tribute to the pagan emperor, would he not thus betray his own followers and his preaching that God alone is to be acknowledged? Christ gracefully punctured the whole scam by replying that we must render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. This was not just a clever avoidance of the trap, but actually an expression of doctrine, of doctrinal teaching by Christ. Well, his response, as you can see, called into being the idea of a dual order, gods and Caesars, religion and the state. The tension growing from this duality would involve believers and government for 20 centuries down to this very moment. The early church, following Christ's death and resurrection, rejected 
the competing, two competing ideas. One, that every aspect of society, including the spiritual and specifically the freedom of the church to practice and teach the faith, was subject to the power of the emperor. But likewise rejected by Christian leaders was the view that the emperor was without a very wide scope of power to promote the common welfare, in particular to assure order. This power was deemed by St. Paul to be a power given by God. I need not remind you that until the fourth century, the Roman emperors behaved as though they were gods instead and severely persecuted Christians and their church. The fourth century, however, brought a total change in the relationship of the two powers as Constantine, newly converted to Christ, became emperor and as emperor gave the church both the benefits and some headaches of being protected as the official religion of the state. In the coming centuries, it would be the aim of great teachers of the church to define how church and state should relate to the new church state. Saints Ambrose and Augustine particularly stressing the need of the state to bring peace and security to society, but holding that the state's power is subject to God's law. Inevitably, conflicts arose on such thorny questions as whether the state might punish heresy, whether emperors would have rights to deal with church property. Pope Gelasius I in the fifth century stressed that in some respects, church and state should be separate. Here's what he had to say. And I'd like to quote it because it's a very perceptive statement. Henceforth, Christian emperors should stand in need of priests for their eternal life. And priests for their part should employ the aid of the imperial government for the direction of temporal matters. To the end that spiritual employment might be removed from carnal diversions, and that the soldier of the Lord might be as little as possible entangled in secular business. And that one involved in secular affairs might not be occupying the leadership of the church. Thus it was sought to secure that both the orders might be humble, since no man could combine eminence in both of them, and that the profession of each might be suited to the special aptitudes of those who follow it. But after the year 600 and the decline of the Roman Empire, the barbarians ravaging of all Europe created chaos, and the church was the sole existing force for peace and order. Perhaps necessarily, leaders of the church became the chief actors in building a new society. This development had an upside and a downside. The upside was the widespread conversion of barbarians to Christianity, the creating of some peace, the beginnings of a rule of law founded on God's commandments. The downside was a too great reliance of the church on secular power and a growing involvement of church leaders in exercising such powers. Two, wealth obtained for the church through these involvements would prove to have a corrupting effect upon some churchmen. By the ninth century, bishops were being invested by kings and kings crowned by popes. The relationship would bring, breed all manner of conflicts. And the rise of the national states after the 14th century, plus the coming of the Reformation in the 16th century, resulted in extreme losses to the church along with a great increase in the power of the state and, in general, new church-state relationships. Religious liberty, as we now know it in the United States, did not exist in Reformation countries or in those of the traditional church. Even England's Toleration Act of 1689 excluded Catholics from toleration. Similarly, in most of the North American colonies, Religious liberty existed only marginally, Catholics in particular being the objects not only of social and economic discrimination, but in particular of legal discriminations. The 18th century brought the Enlightenment. Again, 
a development with pluses and minuses. The idea of the religiously neutral state began to be advanced. The religiously neutral state, a phrase we want to hang on to because we're going to be dealing with very much in terms of developments after 1990 in our country. But this idea began to be advanced. Neutrality, as we shall see, even at this moment, being a concept of many meanings. Its sources were three. One was the wholesome belief, earlier expressed by that devout refugee from religious persecution, Roger Williams, that, as he put it, an enforced uniformity of religion throughout a nation or civil state confounds the civil and the religious, denies the principles of Christianity and civility. Similarly, William Penn inspired Pennsylvania's body of laws of 1682, providing that no one shall in any case be molested or prejudiced for his or her conscientious persuasion or practice, nor at any time be compelled to frequent or maintain any religious worship, place, or ministry, whatever. But the second source of the idea of the religiously neutral state had a purely material motivation. This was the voice of businessmen who found trade disrupted by religious conflicts and hence desired either global religious uniformity or governments which maintain no position for or against any religion. A bit remind, uh, which reminds us, I think, a bit of the attitude of some business conservatives today in relation to the abortion question, disliking very much to have that moral issue make waves uh, politically. The third source of the religiously neutral state idea was well expressed in the statement of Voltaire, the famed proponent of enlightenment. He said, if there had been in England only one religion, its despotism would have been fearful. If there had been two religions, they would have been at each other's throats. But as there are 30, they live peacefully and happily. Voltaire exaggerated. Dissenters, and especially Catholics, did not find life in England, when Voltaire wrote, either peaceable or happy. Nor was that all there was to say to the Enlightenment view of the religiously neutral state its plea for an absolute separation of church and state all too clearly revealed hostility to religion and hence to the primacy of a state power sterilized of all religion. As the Catholic philosopher Father John Courtney Murray was later to say, this plea did not mean separation at all, but perhaps the most drastic unification of church and state which history had known. The Jacobin free state was as regalist as the Ancien Regime, and even more so. As Simon Chama has said in Citizens, his brilliant history of the French Revolution, Rousseau and Voltaire envisioned a state dissolved into the general purposes of the public realm. In a recent book called The Godless Constitution, the authors claim that our Constitution was based on Enlightenment ideas, was drafted by a company of secularists of the Jacobin persuasion. This has been the conclusion pushed by most, most other secularists in our own day, anxious to sterilize public life of religion. But they're far off the mark. The nation was begun in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. That's true historically, but it's also true philosophically. The Declaration said that its signers relied on the protection of divine providence. They did not espouse the skeptical and relativistic views of the French philosophers, but stated that there is truth and that it's knowable. We hold these truths to be self-evident, they said. They spoke of the creation of man by God, all men are created equal, they said, and of supreme importance that the rights of man come from God. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, they said. 
They said that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Declaration is thus really an expression of natural law. And as Russell Kirk has noted, it blended Hebraic, Roman, and Christian understandings of the sanctity of law. It was plainly the preamble to the preamble of our Constitution. I'd like to quote you a marvelous passage written by the French philosopher Jacques Maritain in his book, Man and the State. Far beyond the influences received from the Enlightenment, the constitution of this country is deep-rooted in the age-old heritage of Christian thought and civilization. Paradoxically enough, and by virtue of the serious religious feelings of the Founding Fathers, it appeared at a moment of unstable equilibrium in the history of ideas as a lay, even to some extent, rationalist fruit of the perennial Christian life force, which despite three centuries of tragic vicissitudes and spiritual division, was able to produce this momentous temporal achievement at the dawn of the American nation, as if the losses suffered by human history in the supreme domain of the integrity and unity of faith and in the interest of, of philosophical truth had been the price paid with respect to human weaknesses and entanglements for the release at that given moment of humbler temporal Christian energies that must at any cost penetrate the historical existence of mankind. Peerless is the significance, continues Maritain, for political philosophy of the establishment of the American Constitution at the end of the 18th century. The Constitution can be described as an outstanding lay Christian document tinged with the philosophy of the day. Uh, keeping our focus on religious liberty, we're curious to know how the American Constitution, whose sixth article declares it to be the supreme law of the land, how it relates to religious liberty. To understand that, we have to look at government in America in 1787, the year the U.S. Constitution was presented. Each of the original 13 states would have its own constitution. Some of these protected religion, but Massachusetts and Connecticut long thereafter required tax support for the Congregational Church. The federal constitution at the outset contained but two references to religion. In Article 6, it provided that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office of public trust under the United States. The other reference to religion was simply the Constitution's concluding statement in Article 7, which nobody ever refers to, done in the year of our Lord, 1787. In 1791, 10 amendments were added to our federal Constitution, spelling out rights which were felt to need specific description and protection. It is the first of these amendments to the Bill of Rights on which we now need to focus. Its words are these, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Note the word Congress. Only the federal power was restrained by this amendment, so it appeared. This clause had several origins. The resistance, especially by Baptists, to religious establishments in some of the colonies, with taxation imposed upon persons not of the official faith, the intense intellectual and political labors of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, and undoubtedly a spirit in the newly formed citizenry of rejection of a past of governmentally established religion and the desire to embrace real religious freedom. Madison, in 1785, had brilliantly attacked a bill in the Virginia legislature calling for tax support of churches. His memorial and remonstrance brings us back to the dual order we've earlier mentioned. He said, before any man can be considered a member of civil society, he must be considered as a subject of the governor of the universe. Beyond this, he said, the religion of every man must be less left to the conviction and conscience of every man. 
Now, of recent years, there's been an immense dispute over the meaning of the words of the religion clause, especially that phrase, establishment of religion. But I think it's clear enough from all the historical evidence that what was intended was that there should be no national church or special privilege for any particular church. That is, no established church in the English sense. The other phrase of the First Amendment about the free exercise of religion has also been involved in questions of what it really means. We should look at both the establishment and free exercise phrases as conveying a single message, protection for religious liberty against actions of the Congress. We should also take note of the fact that other words of the First Amendment protecting freedom of speech, press, assembly, and petition may also be protective of religion, as I'm sure uh, Professor Bradley has stressed in his course. Later in this series, we will find ourselves knee-deep in the disputes which raged over the meaning of the First Amendment's religion provision and the Supreme Court's interpretations of this provision. But at the moment, we need to consider one more development in the structure of our Constitution, which will prove highly significant in respect to religious freedom. In 1868, after the conclusion of the Civil War, a 14th Amendment to the Constitution became the law of the land. It dealt not with the federal government, but with the states, and it provided that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The U.S. Supreme Court considered the case of two citizens of New Jersey who had been indicted by a grand jury for the commission of a crime. At their trial, they had refused to go on the witness stand or call any witnesses in their defense. And a trial court judge simply told the jury that the jury could infer, infer guilt from that fact. But the defendants argued that they were protected, protected by a provision of the Federal Bill of Rights, a provision you find in the Federal Bill of Rights against compulsory self-incrimination. The state of New Jersey pointed out that the Bill of Rights protected people only against actions of the federal government. These defendants would have to look to their state constitution for constitutional protection and if they couldn't find it there, too bad. The Supreme Court disagreed, holding that the 14th Amendment's due process clause, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, did not refer to merely to procedures or to fair procedures, but to what the court called certain immutable principles of justice. The court said the idea of those principles as being the law of the land went back to Magna Carta. One of these immutable principles, or fundamental rights, was the right against self-incrimination. That right to take the fifth was one of the rights spelled out in the Bill of Rights Fifth Amendment. The long and short of it is, the Supreme Court's holding that at least some provisions of the Federal Bill of Rights are to be read into the 14th Amendment as applicable to the states through the Due Process Clause. In 1940, the Supreme Court would be holding that the First Amendment's protection of the free exercise of religion was likewise protection of a fundamental right and therefore applicable to the states. Now for another point in our constitutional background necessary to our understanding of religious liberty in the USA. I referred a moment ago to the Supreme Court's interpretation of the First Amendment's religion clause. The Supreme Court decided that it, and not the Congress and not the President, has final say as to the meaning of language of the Constitution. That conclusion has been long disputed indeed by such Americans as Abraham Lincoln, but today it continues to be generally accepted that the Supreme Court is the Constitution's final interpreter. But there is much discomfort over some interpretations of the court these past three decades. We will get later to those decisions as they relate to religion and to morality. One further detail of our picture of constitutional law is the idea of separation of powers. We see that expressed in Roman history and again by Montesquieu in the 18th century. 
Our freedom is best protected by having the legislature, the executive, and the judicial separate, each performing its own function and each a check against the other. Now, when we come to consider the 1997 case involving the Congress's Religious Freedom Restoration Act, we will see how the separation of powers principle relates so much to religious liberty. Now, with this brief picture of some constitutional features in hand, let me position you in the year 1947, when I suppose half of you weren't alive. As we'll later see, this was a year of great change in the Supreme Court's treatment of religious liberty and church-state relationships. Let me stand with you as 1947 opened and point back in terms of religion and its freedom to the America that had been known throughout the 19th century and up till then. Most of you won't recognize that America. The states, to begin with, far more closely related to the lives of their inhabitants than they do today. The states largely represented a Christian ethos. Christian, that is, according to the then beliefs of the predominant Christian Protestants, but very much supported by Catholics. This was expressed in the moral sanctions found in the statutes of all the states. Laws made abortion a criminal offense. So also with adultery, bigamy, sodomy, fornication. There was considerable censorship of publications and entertainment deemed obscene with rather broad definitions of obscenity. No fault divorce was unknown. Sunday laws prohibited secular work on the Christian Lord's Day. In various ways, religious properties were accorded tax exemption. At the national level, Thanksgiving proclamations were seen from the very beginning and oath-taking observed. Sessions of the Supreme Court were opened with the chant by the marshal, which ends in the phrase, God save the United States in this honorable court. And that's still the case. The Northwest Ordinance, enacted by the Congress in 1787, said that education should be encouraged not only because of the need of the citizenry for, citizenry for knowledge, but also because religion and morality, said the Congress, are necessary for the good government and the happiness of mankind. That view became a bedrock principle at, as the ancestors of our present public schools came into being. The common school founded by Horace Mann, midterm 19th century, reflected a sort of non-sectarian Protestantism, Bible reading, King James Version, the Lord's Prayer, and a discipline and outlook compatible with Protestant moral standards of the day, characterized his schools and would long continue, though in ever more watered down fashion, to characterize the public schools of, say, the 1930s. There was not much litigation on religious matters in the 19th and early 20th centuries. For one thing, people just didn't litigate as much as they do today. Also, however, the religious, religious character of the country to which I have just referred was largely unchallenged. Three cases coming before the Supreme Court of the United States, however, resulted in opinions of the court which graphically expressed the sense of the nation in matters pertaining to religion. Let's have a look at these. The first of these cases involved one George Reynolds in the territory of Utah, indicted for crime and sentenced to two years at hard labor. What was his offense? Violation of a federal statute which prohibited in the territories plural marriages. George was married to both Amelia and Mary Ann. He defended himself by proving that his Mormon religion made polygamy his duty and argued that Congress had violated the First Amendment by punishing him for his performance of a religious duty. The Supreme Court disagreed, saying that the Constitution, the Constitution gives government no power to suppress religious opinion, but that it may suppress religious actions, which, as the court put it, are in violation of social duties or subversive of good order. So here we have again the interface of church and state and are reminded of St. Paul's speaking of the need to assure order. The Supreme Court, in upholding Reynolds' conviction, 
set up a constitutional boundary line between religion and government, between the freedom of religious exercise and the protection of society. Cases in our own day will speak of the latter in terms of compelling state interest. But we can see that when our secular courts deal with, secular, with, with state power in relation to religion, they may be getting into a minefield. Note the courts distinguishing between action and belief. You can believe what you want, the court is saying, but government may stop you when you act on those beliefs, even may punish you for doing so. This raises some obvious questions. Of what value is it to protect belief if you can't live out those beliefs in action? That we'll see is a question which will be continually raised in religious liberty cases in our time. Related is this question, how much power should our secular courts have in determining what is needed by the state for the protection of society? We have only to look at the laws of Nazi Germany providing for compulsory sterilization or the Chinese laws on family size today to see the dangers latent in the phrase compelling state interest or the welfare of the state or even in the common good. The Supreme Court decided the Reynolds case holding that yes, our courts may set boundary lines as to how far religious belief may express itself in actions and describing in terms of the social and moral impact of polygamy just what it found to justify its suppression. Though this case would often be cited later on by eager government attorneys as a precedent to uphold, for example, outrageous government attempts to control private religious education. For example, you can believe whatever you want, but you can't carry those beliefs out through your own religious curriculum. No, here the court described marriage as the most important feature of social life, a sacred obligation, it said, upon which society is built, and polygamy as an evil always punishable. That's one expression of the moral consensus of an earlier America. The second of these earlier cases goes into that very question of the power of the civil courts to rule on religious issues. We shan't pause long with it now because We'll need to dwell on it at greater length in one of our late, in our fourth session. But because in discussing the Reynolds case, I got into that question, I felt I should mention the great 1871 case of Watson versus Jones. There are two factions of the Presbyterian Church, a pro-slavery faction and a pro-union faction, were fighting over the control of the Walnut Street Presbyterian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. Never mind why for now. The reason I bring the Watson case to you now is the Supreme Court's holding that our secular courts must not try to decide religious issues. The law, said the court, knows no heresy. Where religious issues are involved in a court case, it was held that judges should not take it on themselves to supplant church officials in saying what the teachings of the church are or how churches should order, organize themselves or be run. You'll note that the Supreme Court in the Mormon case we just discussed did not attempt to interpret Mormon teaching on polygamy or to say that it was a false belief. The court took the Mormons at their word, agreed that they believed polygamy to be a religious duty, and only said that the carrying out of that duty ran directly into major moral and social reasons why they should be punished for that. To come now to the third of those 19th century decisions of the Supreme Court, which expressed the sense of the nation in respect to religion. The Reverend E. Walpole Warren was an Episcopal clergyman living in England. Holy Trinity Church, an Episcopalian church in the USA, made a contract with this Englishman, whereby he came to New York City to become its pastor and rector. But an act of Congress had made it a crime for any person to assist any alien to migrate to the USA to perform work here under a contract made before the migration. The US Circuit Court found Holy Trinity Church guilty of violating that law. On appeal, the Supreme Court of the United States unanimously reversed. The court's opinion read today is fascinating in three ways. First, it makes no mention of the First Amendment. The justices said that the church's conduct was 
exactly the conduct which the words of the statute proscribed, but they said it could never have entered into the heads of the members of Congress to have made it applicable to a religious matter such as this. Such a purpose against religion, said the court, could not be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this, they said, is a religious people. The court did not find itself guilty of judicial activism or overstepping separation of powers by telling the world that it thought the Congress, what, the, what it thought the Congress intended to say. A second interesting aspect of the court's opinion is its powerful upholding of theistic religion. It harkens back to William Penn's reference to the father of lights and spirits. It says the Declaration of Independence recognizes the presence of the divine in human affairs. But the most noteworthy feature of its opinion, flat out, is the statement, this is a Christian nation. I think this statement, backing that up, is important to quote. The court said if we pass beyond these matters to a view of American life as expressed by its laws, its business, its customs, and its society, we find everywhere a clear recognition of the same truth. Among other matters, note the following, the form of oath universally prevailing, concluding with an appeal to the Almighty, the custom of opening sessions of all deliberative bodies and most conventions with prayer, the prefatory words of all wills, in the name of God, amen, the laws respecting the observance of the Sabbath, with the general cessation of all secular business and the closing of courts, legislatures, and other similar public assemblies on that day, the churches and church organizations which abound in every city, town, and hamlet, the multitude of charitable organizations existing everywhere under Christian auspices, the gigantic missionary associations with general support and aiming to establish Christian missions in every quarter of the globe. Hearing these words, the older among you may feel a twinge of the wistfulness one feels in reading Thornton Wilder's Our Town, the sadness of contemplating a past long gone. You'll be looking away from the evils of that society in respect to its black citizens or the social and economic discriminations often faced by Catholics and Jews. But the virtues of this predominantly Christian culture cannot be ignored. That culture would persist well into the 20th century, but our whole picture of the nation would change radically under the bombarding developments of World War I, major immigration, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the welfare state, the civil rights revolution, high-tech developments, the catastrophic destruction of traditional morality, family life, and the barbarism of anti-life practices. For those of us who in all the raging tumult of the moment, see Christ as the one great certainty in the world and the source of all our hopes. The well-being of his church, the Catholic Church, is of supreme importance. But our concern is not for her alone. As Catholics, we are supportive of the efforts of all for the common good, especially as that pertains to the moral order. We are therefore deeply concerned for religious liberty. Our church declared in 1965 on the subject of religious freedom. That freedom, it says, means that all men are to be immune from coercion on the part of individuals or by social groups or of any human powers in such wise that in matters of religion no one is forced to act in a matter, manner contrary to his own beliefs, nor is anyone to be restrained from acting in accordance with his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone or in association with others within due limits. Now the within due limits phrase is explained to refer to the right of society, and I quote now, to defend itself against possible ab abuses committed on the pretext of freedom of religion. In the next five sessions, I'll be exploring the major developments in our constitutional law which have related to that liberty. This will take us into the great cases which have come before the Supreme Court, how they came about, who the people were who brought them about, the good decisions and the bad decisions. I promise you this won't be dry stuff or lawyerese. It will be, I think, a trip of high adventure. As we conclude this session, I thought I should 
take time to briefly speak of our courts, how they function, especially in constitutional litigation, and what litigations are about, how they're handled, who handles them, the functioning of the Supreme Court. Uh, I find that there's much misunderstanding of those matters, and I think it's important to your background to, to have that background as we consider our general subject of religious liberty. Well, the common impression appears to be that people's rights are determined in lawsuits, but sometimes they're not. A case at best goes through a series of stages, like a product which begins with raw materials, then is processed through a succession of steps and is finally finished. A litigant rightly hopes that his case will at least progress from the raw material stage to an ultimate judgment which is arguably rational. But what is generated from counsel table and bench, the presentation of evidence, the examining of witnesses, the counterpoint of judges' questions and rulings, and often the outbreak of the unexpected, may dash that hope. Cases are sometimes baseless affairs which ought never to have been brought, or which are botched by the attorney, or which are thrown out by judges due either to the baselessness, the attorney's botching, or his, own, his honor's own botching. Some cases are skewed by bright clerks of malleable judges. Finally, there is the case which enters a maze, travels about in that maze, and somewhere in it simply dies. These are sorry instances of the wearying down of the right as Charles Dickens expressed in Bleak House. In ever so many cases, courts do not determine rights. Largely uncritically, Americans accept, as we've noted, the idea that their Supreme Court, in many instances, has final say in their public affairs. They have witnessed vast social changes affecting their lives in the most intimate way, brought about by a vote taken not by the elected representatives of 240 million Americans, but among nine citizens who are not elected. Indeed, the single vote of one among the nine sometimes deciding a question of stupendous national importance. In the media, we often hear the litigant's lawyer forthrightly declare, I'll take this case to the Supreme Court. Take it there he may, but the chances of it staying there are utterly remote. More than 5,000 cases are filed with the Supreme Court each term. Many are filed, but few are chosen. Plenary review by the court through the submitting of briefs and oral argument before the court in but a tiny fraction of cases, for the 1996 term, 3% of the cases filed are heard. In most litigations, therefore, the appeal decision of a lower court is left standing. But we're going to be considering cases in which the Supreme Court has acted. These have been of vast effect in our lives, and what the court does in the big cases of the future will likely continue to have that effect. Before we go on to look at the past and the upcoming cases, we need to know a, a bit more about how the Supreme Court operates and more about the role of those citizens who become its justices. The court's a remarkable institution. Alexis de Tocqueville said of it that a more imposing judicial power was never constituted by any people. Madison expressed the ideal that great questions of constitutional interpretation ought not be left to the tumult of the political process, but should be resolved by the seasoned judgment of independent judges. That we say was and is the ideal. But as we all know, the judges, the justices, are politically chosen. Often enough, without theological background, philosophical background, or even a knowledge of history. They are appointed by the president and take office upon the consent of the Senate. They may serve for life unless impeached for lack of good behavior. First Monday is a term famous among Supreme Court practitioners since it denominates the day of opening each term of court, the first Monday of October. 
The court sits for hearing arguments at two-week intervals, with recess in between down until late May or June. Most of the court's work consists of reviewing decisions of lower courts. There are hence no witnesses heard or, or jury impaneled. Several things about the court will impress you greatly if you come for your first time to hear arguments there. One is the majesty of the Supreme Court building itself, and in particular of its courtroom. And there is something always electrifying in the emerging of the justices precisely at 10 a.m. on argument day from behind the massive red curtains to start a day of hearing arguments. There is a sort of stage with four huge marble pillars behind the justices' chairs, causing one way wag to describe the whole scene as looking like nine black beetles in the temple of Karnak. The formality surrounding the sessions is also impressive, except in unusual cases, each side is allowed one half hour to argue. Time is scrupulously kept. A white light shows on counsel's lectern when he has but five minutes left, and a red light when his time has expired. Rumor has it that if thereafter he continues to talk, a trap door is sprung beneath him and he's never heard from again. It's said that Chief Justice Charles Evan Hughes once stopped a lawyer in the middle of the word if. Such tales do help to convey the high 18th century formality of Supreme Court proceedings. Formality, yes, but what surprises visitors to the court is the relative informality of the justices as oral argument ensues. It's essentially a low-key colloquy between court and counsel, though occasionally with a more spirited interrogation by justices, justices and almost always counsel is asked questions. The roughly 5,000 cases filed each term with the court are reviewed by clerks for their respective justices. The court has broad discretion in most cases as to what it's going to hear. Basically, we can say that the decision to hear and decide a case is based on the, what the court feels it's, is, is its importance to the nation. That's a slight oversimplification, but it will do for our purposes today. As you can readily see, the element of the subjective is unavoidably present in this choice. By and large, the court follows the so-called rule of four, that is, a case will be brought on for full review if a minimum of four justices vote to bring it on. Our next session is going to deal with a string of cases which have been making headlines for the past half century, yes, from 1947. These are the cases about the use of public funds to aid education in religious schools. I label this second session, Economic Religious Liberty. Thank you.